Now that we've covered cladistics, biostratigraphy and correlation, and biogeography, you can integrate all these lines of evidence to study the causes of observed paleobiogeographic patterns. These types of studies are like cool detective puzzles where you have to pull together evidence from plate tectonics, paleogeography, and paleontology to figure out why certain species are found where they are. Let's use a modern example to illustrate one of these puzzles. So the ratite birds, which are like ostriches and their rel relatives, have this odd biogeographic distribution with different species occurring on widely separated continents, the ostrich in Africa, the emu in Australia, so forth. Those types of separated occurrences are called a disjunct distribution. So how might such a distribution arise? Well, one possibility is that there were once species connecting all these now isolated groups and that the gaps that we see were caused by extinctions of those connecting species. So that's a possibility, but we're not going to consider that one anymore today. But instead, we'll focus on two biogeographic aspects of speciation, the evolution of new species from ancestral ones. So these disjunct distributions may reflect dispersal, where a new species migrates to an area that's distinctly separated from the area where the ancestral species lived. The top example illustrates that, and it shows how the most primitive taxon, taxon number one, the lowest branch on, on your cladogram, inhabited region A, the left wedge of the yellow-orange pie diagram. The more derived species, two and three, dispersed to areas B and C. Because we only know that B and the, the taxon two and three share a common ancestor, we can't distinguish between the two different patterns A to C to B or A to B to C. Disjunct distributions may also be caused by, or instead caused by, something called vicariance. In that, it's the formation of some kind of barrier, like a mountain range, or an ocean basin, or a, a land barrier between oceans, um, splits a pre-existing species into two groups, allowing speciation on either side of that barrier. So in the lower example, species 1 originally lived over the entire circle, region A, in the left-hand uh, circle. Uh, but that large region was split into two by a barrier, and one of those subpopulations in the right-hand wedge evolved into species two in this area called B. Species two was later split into two smaller groups by another barrier that led to the speciation of, of taxon three in region C. So one thing that you may have noted is that the cladogram and the final distribution, the large wedge of A and the two smaller wedges of B and C, are the same for both dispersal and vicariance. So you clearly need more information to distinguish between these two scenarios. So to test for vicariance or dispersal, and to distinguish between those two, you need three things. A phylogeny, data on the age of the taxa or on the timing of the divergences, for example from biostratigraphy, and information about the distribution of the taxa at different time intervals. So the key critical piece of information that you need is the geographic distribution of the ancestral species. So let's take this example illustrated here. Uh, the evolution of species B, the one in, in panel number two in the figure, is an example of speciation during vicariance because species A used to live in both areas including the area in which B is now found. If you looked at the stratigraphic distribution of fossils in that region, you should find A in older rocks and B in younger rocks. The evolution of species C is also driven by vicariance uh, because B occurred in both regions in panel 3 uh, before C evolves in just one of them. The same is true for the evolution of D, also by vicariance. Vicariance is supported by the former presence of species C in the region now inhabited by D. But the evolution of species E is in panel 5 is different, however. It's dispersal and not vicariance because the ancestral species, species C, was not present in the region occupied by the descendant species E. E is found in a new area where C was never present. So here's an example that is most likely vicariance from a modern uh, organisms. 
So this study looked at seven species of shrimp from the Pacific coast of Panama. Those are labeled P1 through P7 on the cladogram. And seven species from the Caribbean side labeled C1 through C7. In all cases on the cladogram, the species pair up. C1 with C2, uh, C1 with P1, sorry, um, P2 with C2, C3 with P3, so forth. So they're called sister species because they are most closely related and they shared a single common ancestor. But the disjunct distribution, having the closest related species, one on the Caribbean side and one on the Pacific side, is best explained by vicariance after formation of the, the Panama Isthmus around three or four million years ago or so. So this study uses DNA, uh, so all the species in the cladogram are living, but the prediction that we would make would be that each species pair, C1 and P, P1, C2 and P2, um, evolved from an ancestor that was more widely distributed in the past. So here's another observation that's most likely vicariance, and people have observed that the similarity of, of fossil bivalve faunas on the western side and the eastern side of the North Atlantic Ocean decreased from the Jurassic and, and Cretaceous through the Cenozoic to the present. So early in the spreading of the North Atlantic, say like 185 or 165 million years ago, the two left-hand dots on the graph, uh, the ocean basin was, was narrow, and that means that the larvae of many species could drift from one side to the other, so there was quite a lot of similarity between the western and the eastern sides. But as the ocean gradually widened, say 125 million years ago or 88 million years ago, uh, progressively fewer species had larvae that could travel across that wide distance. And therefore, the species composition on each side gradually evolved to be increasingly distinct. So because of larval dispersal limitations and the speciation related to vicariance and dispersal, different parts of the world contain different species. This is a fairly obvious and intuitive fact, but it provides us with some interesting tools that we can use. So as a result, we can divide the globe into biogeographic realms and provinces, or faunal realms and provinces. Like in this Cambrian trilobite example, the paleogeographic map shows that North America and Europe, on the left-hand left side in the center, uh, were dominated by trilobites belonging to the suborder Olenellina, um, but other regions, like Australia or China, the ones towards the right-hand side, instead contain these red licked trilobites. So it's called the Olenellid realm and the red licked realm. This division of realms and provinces is a hierarchical type division, uh, where realms are the biggest unit, um, and they can contain provinces. So this Permian brachypod example shows the three realms, the northern boreal, the tropical paleoequatorial realm and the southern Gondwanan, or sometimes called nodal realm. Um, but those are subdivided into provinces like A, B, and D, and C on this map. And, but those sub-provinces themselves, or those, those provinces themselves, can then be divided into sub-provinces like A1 or A2. So the distribution of these faunal provinces and the reason that there are boundaries and divisions between them relates to factors like climate or ocean circulation um, or currents um, and other related factors. So this paleobiogeography can play an important role in reconstructing things like past environments, climate gradients from the equator to the pole, ocean conditions and circulation, and so forth.